Hi, I'm Siobhan Sarna, and welcome back to season two of the SIBO SOS podcast. In this episode, microbiologist Kieran Krishnan, co-founder of Microbiome Labs, is sharing his latest research into the microbiome and the three-step healing process he has developed for total gut restoration. Kieran has been incredibly generous to the SIBO SOS community. He's actually given us a special way to get the famous Megaspore probiotic and other microbiome lab products at a 15% discount. Now, normally you have to go to a practitioner's office to order these products, but the SIBO SOS community, and that means you too, because you're listening to this podcast, can order it directly. Simply register on the microbiomelabs.com site with the patient direct code SIBO SOS. And then you can use discount code Digestion SOS at checkout for 15% off your first order. So make that order count because that is a huge discount. I'll put all the details in the show notes. It's really quite straightforward and simple. Also, Karen's going to be referencing a few slides during our conversation. If you want to see those and watch the video of this talk, be sure to check the show notes for the link. Hi, everybody. I see that you're popping in, which is great. Thank you. Kieran is going to be right here. I have a little kitty cat saying hi. So we're going to have a great time just approving a few more people. And you know, I like to start on time. So we'll be super efficient today as always. Tell me where you're from and what's going on with you. How are you guys today? Hi. Hi. Great, Lisa. Hi. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Jen. Hey, girl. Hey, Carlene. A um, couple of announcements while we're waiting for um, Karen to join us. Hi, glad you guys are here. I have your questions in the event area of the Facebook group, and I have to look at it on my phone so I don't keep popping out of here because it gets really distracting, and I don't want to do that. I want to make sure we're in the right spot. And then the other thing is I wanted to let you know that on November 1st, we have um, a special chance to do a Q&A with Dr. Stephen Sandberg Lewis. Hi. Hi. How Super are you? Star. How are you? Good. Sorry. I was actually on a radio interview that was going long. So I uh, apologize for that, but I'm no here. Problem. No problem. There you are. Okay, good. Yeah. Look, we're happy for any time that we get with you, sir. <laughs> uh, excellent. Well, I'm, I'm glad, very glad to be here and uh, love talking about this particular topic. So uh, hopefully we can give people a lot of good information. Okay, hang on for just a second because I need to make sure that I've done this right. Okay. And um, I know I know you know how to share your screen too, right? Uh, on this, yes, I believe so. I okay. see the share button, so. So we are live. Lots of people here, Pat and Chris. Just want to make sure I'm broadcast. I'm also recording. And I oh, am. okay, great. Okay. All good, all good. Just, I've learned the hard way, right? <laughs> So, so, so for those of you who are not familiar with this incredible gentleman, Kieran Krishnan, he is the person who brings us Megaspore probiotics, as well as a variety of, of products to help us heal our gut and have that good balance of our microbiome. He is a philanthropist. He's a great dad. He's a great friend, a great leader in this field, and he educates other educators and other doctors and practitioners and researchers in the field of microbiome health. And Kieran, how many studies have you guys accomplished even just this year alone? So this year alone, we've done, I think, seven. Um, and we've completed, I think, now a total of 13 or 14 together over the last couple of years, and, and we still have about um, eight or nine studies initiated. So we've got a whole total of about 20 trials going on uh, in some form or the other all over the world in different regions. Um, so I, I'm, I have the great fortune of traveling around and working with all these researchers in different parts of the world to figure out the science behind a lot of this stuff and, and you know, create some really powerful tools for people to take their health on, in their own hands. So today we're going to be talking about rebuilding our gut. Yeah. And I have a couple of very specific questions for you from the group, but I'd love it if you would get started and just talk to us about this protocol that you have designed within the world of, uh, of your, your products and the results of your research 
And then also, guys, we have some discounts for you. You know, I love a good discount. <laughs> so we'll be telling you about that as we go. And I'll also post it in the um, thread and I'll post it in an email and that kind of thing. So go ahead and tell us about a way we can all get our gut restored. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about something we call the total gut restoration. Um, this is a version of a talk that I do at a lot of uh, health and medical conferences. And, and the, in, the um, inception of this really came from, you know, working with functional medicine doctors and health practitioners and understanding their pain points. You know, what are the difficulties that they're having in treating their patients? So, you know, this is a scenario that I, that I hear about all the time. Imagine you're a functional medicine doctor or, or health practitioner and your first patient of the day comes in and he or she is dealing with diabetes and weight issues and metabolic dysfunction. And you know, because of your training, your instincts, uh, your reading, that they have something wrong with their gut that's driving these conditions, right? And then the second pa patient, patient that comes in has uh, an autoimmune condition, whether it's lupus or Hashimoto's or eczema or psoriasis. Again, you know that there's something wrong with the gut that's driving that condition. And then the third person that comes in is somebody with anxiety, depression, you know, mood disorders. And again, you know that there's something wrong with their gut. And, and that it's driving the condition. But here's the question, and this is where it gets difficult. How do you know what is wrong with each of their guts, right? And if you don't know what is wrong with each of their guts, how do you go about treating it, right? It's a guess. So functional medicine has done a lot of guessing work on figuring out what could be effective to treat people's guts. So they throw probiotics at you, prebiotics, some aloes, some glutamine, some charcoal in some cases, antimicrobial. So, uh, you know, admittedly, every functional medicine doctor will talk to you. Uh, if you're talking to them uh, casually, will tell you, yes, it's all trial and error. You know, we're just throwing stuff to see what works because it's very hard to pinpoint what is wrong with each individual's gut. So that became a problem for me to solve, right? That was to me something that we shouldn't have to deal with. That's something our uh, functional medicine docs and practitioners shouldn't deal with. That shouldn't be something that individuals shouldn't deal with where you really have no idea what is going on within your digestive tract that's driving your condition. So we started digging in. We've got about seven or eight years worth of research work going into this part of the talk. Um, and we were trying to figure out what are the most common dysfunctions that are driving chronic illness within the digestive system. And as it turns out, the vast majority of chronic illnesses, as different as they can be, as different as diabetes is from an autoimmune condition or as, as different as anxiety is from reflux disease, you know, they present completely differently, but they still have the same root cause. And it's the same thing going on dysfunctionally in all of those digestive tracts, right? So that's the basis of this particular talk. Now, there's a lot of studies in this talk. I'll just kind of run through those really quickly and not inundate you guys with, with a bunch of research papers and all that. Um, but I will just kind of go through them in a very cursory way just to show you that there is evidence behind what we're talking about here, not something that we, we just made up. And again, this kind of talk we often do for continuing education credit. So these research papers and all have been vetted by committees that look through all of this stuff, right? So you're getting kind of a preview and a very fast version of what a lot of doctors and I'll get at these conferences. So let me jump into that. I will share my um, screen here. Tell me if this looks right, Siobhan. Can you see this normally? I did, yep, I can see it. And um, it looks like it's still like a little bit in preview mode because you can see the, the slides on the left as well. Okay, how about now? There we go, there we go. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So, so we call it the, you know, the, the title of this talk is the most common dysfunctions of the standard American gut as it's, as it's related to chronic illness. So when we started looking at, um, you know, what is going on in the gut that starts to break down that drives chronic illness, we, we basically came down to this particular sy uh, uh, system, systemic problem. So first, it's important to understand what a healthy gut looks like in general and what are the important um, uh, structures and conditions in a particular healthy gut. So look, if you look here, this is the a typical example of an intestinal lining. You've got two very important structures in the intestinal lining. The first one is this mucosal layer, 
So that's basically a mucus layer on your intestinal lining. And the lining itself is this, what we call the epithelial layer. The epithelial layer is a one cell thick lining of, of uh, intestinal cells that make up the barrier between the outside of your gut, which is out here, and the inside of your gut, which is in here. Now, once you get in here, you're already in the circulatory system. You're entering the portal vein, you're entering the circulation. It's called the basolateral circulation. So this little lining of intestinal cells is your last line of defense from things like toxins and all that moving in from the outside of your body, which is up here, the lumen of your intestine, to the inside part of your body, which is in the circulation right here, right? So this mucosal barrier is a very important barrier to preventing things from migrating through that shouldn't be migrating through. Uh, and in the mucosal layer, there's two distinct sections to it. There's this top part of the mucosal layer, which is kind of a watery layer. Uh, it's more liquid-like, more viscous. And this inner part is a thick gel-like structure. So it acts like a physical barrier to add things entering into this intestinal lining and beyond. So now there's a reason why these two things have different colors. One is this physical structure itself is different. Number two, as you can see, all of the microbes are predominantly up in this top section of the mucosa, right? You get very little bit of microbial uh, function and, uh, and colonization on the inner part of the mucosa. This inner sanctum is supposed to be relatively sterile. If bacteria start to enter this area, all of the immune cells in your intestinal lining start to think that you've got a bacterial invasion coming in and they start to freak out and they recruit a whole bunch of immune actors into the space and cause a lot of inflammation and damage. So that's the important things to remember. There's two parts of the mucosa, the top part that is more of a liquid layer where most of the bacteria exists. You've got the inner part of the mucosa, which is relatively sterile and is a thick kind of barrier structure. And then you've got the intestinal lining itself, which are the cells that control what gets through your, uh, your intestinal lining. Now, the way this is, this is maintained and protected is with having high diversity within your microbiome. And you've got very particular strains we call keystone strains that protect this entire structure. They produce the mucus, they regenerate the intestinal lining cells and so on. They also improve the, um, the secretory IgA and other immunoglobulin activity against pathogens in this upper part of the mucosa. You also need high production of short chain fatty acids. That's what SCFA stand for, short chain fatty acids. Most people are familiar with butyrate as an example of a well-known short chain fatty acid. When butyrate is produced at high levels, it stimulates these green cells called goblet cells, which produce new layers of this mucus. Now imagine this mucus is continuously produced from the bottom and is driven up and all of the toxins and all that it captures is driven out and you end up defecating it out on a regular basis. This entire mucosal structure can regenerate itself within about 72 hours, right? So you're constantly in a healthy gut generating new mucus. It's pushing pathogens and toxins and all that out, which are captured in this mucus layer and you're defecating it out. So the production of short chain fatty acids are absolutely critical to the, to the integrity of this structure. And then lastly, the well-formed tight junctions. Tight junctions are the spaces in between these intestinal epithelial cells. And these spaces are, are supposed to be dynamic and remain closed. In some cases, they will open to allow certain nutrients through, but all of that is heavily controlled by these cells. When your gut becomes leaky and dysfunctional, these tight junctions in between the cells break open because you've got proteins in there that control it, those proteins get inflamed and damaged and they break open. And now you've got massive gaps in between these cells. That's how things go, go awry and people end up with severe leaky gut. So this is what it looks like in a healthy gut. In a dysfunctional gut, it looks something like this. And how this starts is it always starts with something called dysbiosis, right? Most people have heard that term and it means a dysfunction or a disproportion in your uh, bacterial population. It means it's the bacterial population has gone from well balanced and functional to imbalanced and really not functional. All right, right now, there's two ways of really defining dysbiosis. Uh, one is through low levels of keystone strains. 
So those are those important protective strains that I talked about, whose job it is to regenerate the mucosal lining, to uh, upregulate the, the uh, immune system so that you can produce more secretory IgA, to bring down inflammatory response, to rebuild the gut lining itself, the intestinal cells. All of these functions of keeping this system healthy fall upon many of these keystone strains. So as you start losing these keystone strains, you start seeing dysbiosis. So some of these keystone strains are Acromantia mucinophila, Fecalum bacteria prosnitsi, Bifidobacterium longum, Bifidobacterium adolescentes, uh, this Rumnococcus, so there's several of them that have been identified to be really important strains in protecting the host from this uh, issue developing. Now, once you have low levels of keystone strains, you also start to get overgrowth of certain types of microbes and, and um, underperforming of other beneficial microbes. So you end up with something called low diversity within the microbiome. And diversity is absolutely critical within the microbiome in order to maintain health. I'll show you a couple of studies uh, in the upcoming slides. But if you look at the last 10 years of microbiome research, the one thing that is, uh, that is always consistent across the board is diversity in the gut microbiome is associated with health. It's associated with resistance to infection. It's also associated with longevity which I'll show you a study of. So diversity in the gut microbiome is really, really important to overall health. And as these keystone strain levels start to drop, you start to lose diversity in the microbiome. Then you also start losing the production of important postbiotics. These postbiotics are things like short chain fatty acids, which we just talked about, which are really important for rebuilding this mucosa, for regenerating these intestinal si uh, cells, for providing energy to these particular intestinal lining cells to bring down inflammation in the gut, to feed the liver, to feed the brain, all of these really important things. And they also control numerous metabolic signals, especially glucose metabolism. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. But when you have low uh, keystone strains, you end up with low diversity. And when you end up with low diversity, you end up with low levels of production of these important short chain fatty acids. So then what happens is microbes that are good at breaking down this mucosal layer as part of their diet start to become overabundant because you don't have the keystone strains keeping them in check. You, you have low levels of diversity, which means you don't have a lot of competing bacteria. So certain bacteria that break down the mucus layer end up growing uh, too much. And when they do, they start eating away at this inner part of the mucus layer. When they eat away at the inner part of the mucus layer, this upper part starts to flood in to this area that I call the inner sanctum, where you're not supposed to have a whole bunch of bacteria and viruses and uh, bacterial toxins and all that. So as you start getting a flooding in of these, uh, of these microbes into this inner part, you start getting a disrupted mucosal barrier system, right? And then a disrupted mucosal immune response. And that's really important because most of how your body responds to things that you're exposed to are dictated by what happens in this mucosal layer. Whether you're sensitive to certain food types, whether you have environmental allergies, you have pet allergies, all of those immune reactions to the most common things that you're exposed to are dictated by the type, by, by the mucosal immune response. That's the immune cells in your mucosa, seeing things come in and then reading what those things are and trying to decide how it's gonna to respond to that. When your mucosa is broken down like this and you get a constant flooding in of bacteria and toxins and viral uh, particles and food particles into this inner sanctum, your mucosal response gets disrupted in that your mucosa responds inflammatorily towards everything that you're exposed to. That's how you develop all these sensitivities and allergies and all that. The problem with this inflam inflammation response is it, is it does two things. Number one, it translates to the rest of the body. The gut lining is like the central command center for the immune system. So the gut immune system or the gut mucosa immune response is inflammatory. You're going to have an immune response that's inflammatory all throughout the rest of your body as well, whether it's in your nose, your upper respiratory tract, your urogenital tract through your skin, no matter where the, the, the section is, if the gut mucosa is responding to everything in an inflammatory fashion, everything else in your body becomes inflamed as well. Then you get a whole bunch of 
recruitment of immune cells to this area, inflammation damages the lining, so you end up getting a dysfunctional gut barrier, and now you have what becomes full-on leaky gut, or metabolic endotoxemia is the more accurate scientific term for it. But basically what you get now is a completely disruptive barrier uh, function. You've got microbes in your, in your gut that are acting pathogenically and are releasing toxins that are being absorbed into your system, and the toxins are causing further and further damage down your gut lining as well. So it's very important to keep these things in mind. Dysbiosis is how it all starts, and then it leads to low levels of keystone strains like Acromantia, Fecalum bacteria. Then you end up losing diversity in the microbiome. Then the next step is these postbiotics like short-chain fatty acids start to become reduced in their production. That automatically allows for the disruption of the inner part of the mucosa without adequate regeneration of the, of the mucosa. And then you get a flooding in of bacteria, viruses, food particles, environmental toxins, and all that in this inner sanctum, which causes a recruitment of severe inflammatory response in the gut lining, which eventually damages these gut lining back, uh, cells, and then your gut becomes very leaky, and all of that stuff ends up leaking through and into your circulatory system. So that's how people become really sensitive, and it starts the process of, of setting people up for chronic illness. Right, So when we look through this very specific process that starts with dysbiosis, and keep in mind the dysbiosis could be driven by a single course of antibiotics you took when you were seven years old, and your gut just never recovered from it because we didn't do anything specific to recover the gut microbiome from it. It could be from years of eating processed food and making poor lifestyle choices. It could be from um, you know, cr chronic exposure to Roundup and glyphosate, the strong antimicrobial pesticide uh, that a lot of people get exposed to. So, you know, there's a number of things that can drive this dysbiosis. It could be a gut infection when you go and you travel abroad somewhere. Uh, but no matter what starts the dysbiosis, this is the cascade of events that leads to a dysfunctional immune response and chronic systemic inflammation and significant sensitivities to lots of things. Because now, your body is responding in an inflammatory manner to anything your mucosa comes across and touches, right? So this is the dysfunction that we identified as being the most common dysfunction. Then we started looking to see, is this dysfunction responsible for driving various, num uh, various kinds of chronic illnesses? So the next few slides, I'm going to show you what we call review papers. If you're not familiar with them, they are meta-analysis or review papers where um, authors who are, are scientists that are experts in the field, they review hundreds, in some cases, thousands of research papers on a particular topic, and they, and they publish the consensus of all of those reports uh, in a single review paper or meta-analysis paper. Now, those are the most important kind of research papers because it's not just one study that showed one thing. They are analyzing hundreds of studies on the topic and coming up to a scientific concession. Um, so scientific, sorry, scientific conclusion, not concession. Um, so that is really important. I'm going to show you a few of these uh, research papers that you know basically show you that the, these same dysfunctions are at the root cause of many uh, numerous types of uh, chronic illnesses. So here's one. This is, again, a review paper looking at modulation of the gut microbiota. They concluded that the disruption of the gut microbiota has been implicated in many conditions um, and diseases, including obesity, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, type 2 diabetes, and colorectal cancer. So these things on the right-hand side here are direct quotes from the paper itself. And they say, as we gain a deeper understanding of the specific relationship between the gut microbiota and disease, they, they um, recommend something called intelligent modulation of the intestinal community, which could have uh, considerable interest and possibly extremely beneficial for human health. Because they have shown that dysbiosis and the specific kind of dysbiosis where you see low diversity, low keystone strains, overgrowth of certain pathogens, seem to be responsible and at the root cause of all of these varied conditions, obesity, IBD, irritable bowel syndrome, type 2 diabetes, colorectal cancer, and so on. So it's clear from this review paper, from this analysis of dozens of other studies, um, they found that dysbiosis is at the root cause of many of these conditions. 
Here's another um, example, the gut, uh, titled Gut Microbiome and Inflammatory Bowel Disease. This is, again, another review paper. They showed that looking at people with IBD, and they compared the gut microbiome of people with IBD uh, against age match and sex match cohorts that did not have IBD, and they found that the most consistent observation in IBD is reduced bacterial diversity, right? So of all the things that are going on in the gut in IBD, all of the inflammatory and disease processes that are going on, the one thing that they found that was really different between those that have IBD and those that don't is that bacterial diversity tends to be very low in those with IBD. So they also talk about a number of trials have shown that therapies that correct dysbiosis, in this case, they talk about fecal microbiome transplants and probiotics are quite promising in IBD. And again, this is a review paper. Another review paper on one of those keystone strains, Acromantia mucinophila. Uh, this is a mini review because they looked at something like 10 or 12 papers, but they showed that Acromantia mucinophila is inversely associated with obesity, diabetes, cardiometabolic disease, and low-grade inflammation. Inversely associated means when this bacteria is high, the risk for all of these conditions is low. When this bacteria is low, the risk for these conditions go up higher. So this particular bacteria, the single species in your gut, a keystone strain, protects against almost 30-something conditions that fall under cardiometabolic disease, including obesity, diabetes, low-grade inflammation, and so on. So they've shown that the administration or increase of Acromantia mucinophila in certain studies have been able to, um, ha has been able to drive the reversal of things like sugar dysfunction, diabetes, uh, inflammatory bowel disorder, obesity, and so on. So again, remember dysbiosis, it starts that uh, first review paper showed all of these chronic conditions associated with dysbiosis. Low diversity drives things like inflammatory bowel disease, low levels of this keystone strain Acromantia, is associated with increased risk of all of these different uh, conditions. Then here's the, another keystone strain called uh, Fecalum bacteria prosnitsi. Again, a review article, they found that the abundance of Fecalum bacteria prosnitsi was decreased in IBD patients compared to control. So they talk about the uh, using a systemic review shows that the, there's a protective benefit of Fecalum bacteria prosnitsi against the development of IBD, and they suggest perhaps probiotics or prebiotics to increase the level of uh, fecal and bacteria prosnitsi in IBD um, are, could be very successful attempts. So uh, treating this condition, again, another really important keystone strain. Uh, another perspective uh, paper, they talk about leaky cell-cell junction. Those are the tight junctions that I talked about in between the cells, which become disrupted and open up when the, there's a lot of inflammation going on. They talk about how this contributes to inflammatory and autoimmune disease. They list things, uh, they list three big studies that show that this epithelial barrier dysfunction, this leakiness in between the cells, is involved in IBD, autoimmune disease, and systemic infection. So it makes people more susceptible to things like, um, you know, infections from, uh, from spirochetes, for example, like in the case of Lyme, or uh, Epstein-Barr virus, or cytomegalovirus, all of these chronic latent infections that people seem to be suffering from that trigger their autoimmune response and other immune dysfunctions. They also show that pathogenic bacteria that induce intestinal barrier deflex, uh, defects will translocate, meaning it will, pa will pass through that intestinal lining and will translocate into the lymph node and liver. So you, now you've got pathogenic bacteria that's supposed to be in that top layer but because that layer gets broken down and the inner layer gets broken down and the tight junctions open up, you now have pathogenic bacteria that move through. And once they're in the circulation, they end up in the lymph nodes and they end up in the liver. And that can trigger systemic autoimmune disease, such as lupus. Right? So these studies and these review papers are very clear in that initial dysfunction I showed you is a major driver of all of these conditions. Here's one that's actually quite different. This is the gut-brain uh, barrier in major depression. They looked at mucosal dysfunction and inflammation in the mucosa. Like I showed you, when that inner part of the mucosa gets broken down and bacteria and all start flooding in and you get lots of inflammation in that inner part of the mucosa, they showed the results show that intestinal mucosal dysfunction is characterized by increased translocation, so that's a movement from one place to the other, of gram-negative bacteria, which is the main type of bacteria that ends up in leaky gut, 
uh, causing problems plays a role in the inflammatory pathophysiology of depression. So that same mucosal dysfunction is driving conditions even like depression. So think about it, the same dysfunction driving depression, uh, driving cardiometabolic syndrome, obesity, diabetes, autoimmune disease, these are all very different conditions and are seemingly unrelated and yet they're all driven by the same root cause, the same dysfunction. Here's another one that's quite different from everything else. And again, this is a review paper showing that gastroesophageal reflux disease, so GERD, uh, is due to mucosal inflammation. So once you get to that mucosal inflammation, it significantly increases your risk of developing chronic GERD. So gastroesophageal reflux disease, again, is very different than depression, and yet it's the same kind of uh, dysfunction that is driving both of these conditions. Uh, we, you know, there's a lot of study on this mechanism in HIV AIDS because they've, they've been able to show that the biggest driver of the convergence of the disease from just HIV positive to AIDS, which is a full acquired immune deficiency syndrome, which is what ends up, uh, you know, killing the subjects that are dealing with it, um, is the mucosal dysfunction itself. It's how leaky the gut is and how dysfunctional the mucosal structure is. And in fact, they show that severe mucosal immune dysfunction is associated with the progression to AIDS. So when, you go, when, when an individual goes who is infected with HIV, goes from having HIV, which you can live with for decades, to having full-blown AIDS, that progression to AIDS is driven by mucosal dysfunction. And this is a, a really great model to study how severe that mucosal dysfunction is in terms of compromising your immune system and driving inflammatory conditions. Again, same mucosal dysfunction drives reflux disease and drives depression. You know, so it's, it's, and those are all so different in terms of the, the way the conditions present themselves, and yet it's the same root cause. Uh, here's a study on diversity and aging, and they found that individuals who lived over the age of 90, uh, who had really he good, healthy outcomes, had uh, diversity in their gut microbiome that was, this, that was similar to those in their 30s. So those who are older with low diversity and as diversity drops have significantly uh, increased their risk of chronic illness. If you can maintain diversity like, like healthy people have in their 30s, you can actually live over the age of 90 without much complication at all. Uh, so that's what this, this study showed. So diversity is ex uh, extremely important uh, for maintaining health and wellness within the microbiome. So that's the overall picture when you have these uh, dysfunctions, and you know, and I could have gone on. There's like 15 more slides uh, to show you on the research papers, but I'll spare you guys that torture. Uh, but I do want you to see that there's a significant amount of science showing the support for how this particular mechanism, which starts with dysbiosis and ends up with leaky gut, is a major driver of a variety of chronic illnesses. It's not just gut dysfunctions, right? It's not just IBD. It's not just cramping and bloating and IBS and Crohn's and colitis, it is ref reflux disease, it's depression, it's immune dysfunctions, it's autoimmune disease. All of these things are driven by the same dysfunction. And ultimately, one of the main things that occurs when you have this dysfunction and this breakdown in your gut is these little pesky things called LPS, lipopolysaccharide, end up leaking through your gut on a regular basis. And that drives something called metabolic endotoxemia. Now, there's a bunch of studies I could show you after this on metabolic endotoxemia and what it does. I'll just breeze through them in like a couple of minutes. Uh, basically, the clinical manifestation of that LPS leaking through that dysfunctional gut on a regular basis fall under everything in the metabolic syndrome umbrella, heart disease, lipid problems, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, dementia, cancer, uh, cancers, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, all of these things are driven by LPS endotoxemia or metabolic endotoxemia. That means in a dysfunctional gut, you've got that barrier that's broken down, you've got the leakiness in the tight junctions, and this LPS, this lipopolysaccharide that's made by your commensal bacteria in your gut microbiome is allowed to leak through and enter your circulation. When it enters your circulation, it causes massive systemic inflammation that has been shown to be a major driver and root cause um, issue in chronic illness as well. Here's one that shows that it actually initiates obesity and insulin resistance. 
a number of these studies done by the American Diabetic Association. Here's another one that shows it causes something called central insulin resistance. And you know, cause uh, issue. Oh, I can hear myself. Just hit the wrong button. Everything's oh, fine. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so you can still hear me good? Yeah, great. Okay. Um, so this shows that even in, in younger people, um, irrespective of body weight changes, meaning you don't have to be obese, you can be perfectly lean and still end up with type 2 diabetes because LPS, that lipopolysaccharide from the gut, can, re can induce low-grade inflammation, especially in the brain, in the hypothalamus, which causes something called central insulin resistance, which disrupts the communication between your brain and your body, where your brain is trying to read your blood glucose levels. Right, so this can occur in people in the uh, who are 15, 16, 17, and who aren't even obese. Um, and it's because of the leakiness in the gut and the systemic inflammation it drives. Here's another major study that was published just last year, and they showed that the number one predictor of whether someone develops diabetes is the degree of leakiness in their gut and this and the presence of LPS, this lipopolysaccharide in the plasma. So how much of it is leaking through on a regular basis? Um, here's a study showing on Alzheimer's, the major driver of the onset of Alzheimer's is microbiome-derived lipopolysaccharide. It leaks from the gut through that dysfunctional barrier and gets into the circulation, goes into the brain in the perinuclear region, and it cre creates inflammation that starts killing off brain cells, which is the characteristic um, start of Alzheimer's brain disease, right? So here's a thing that can, uh, that can lead to... Um, uh, things like hypogonadism, so low testosterone in men, can lead to cardio cardiovascular disease, cardiometabolic syndrome, diabetes, also Alzheimer's, and then we see the same thing in Parkinson's as well. It's also the number one uh, driver in mortality in cancer. You know, one of the things that cancer patients are susceptible to is something called cachexia. Cachexia is that body-wasting syndrome, right? They used to think that cachexia was driven by the chemotherapy and driven by the reduction in what people tend to eat because their guts are upset, they're not feeling well, they're very sick. Um, but as it turns out, cachexia is driven by lipopolysaccharide, by leakiness in the gut. And cachexia accounts for almost 60% of cancer mortality. So if we can reduce the incidence rate of cachexia, that body wasting, that dropping of a lot of weight, uh, slowing down of the metabolism in cancer patients, you know, it can be a significant help to them. And there's, and I'm, I'm very excited that there's a number of groups that are studying this uh, quite closely together. And as it turns out, it, ha it is independent of any chemotherapy or food intake reduction uh, in these cancer patients. So huge variety of implications. Here's a whole bunch of other ones. Um, I'll highlight just a couple of them that are that are quite interesting, but all of this together is about 70 reference papers uh, to look at this. You know, things like mood and appetite disorders, the LPS can actually disrupt ghrelin function in the brain. Uh, it can actually cross the blood-brain barrier and cause a dysfunction in dopamine and serotonin in the brain, uh, causes leptin resistance, which is a weight issue. Anxiety, uh, it can drive anxiety by inhibiting the, the binding of serotonin mm -hmm. and dopamine. It can cause chronic pain uh, in people in the periphery by stimulating something called a dorsal root. Um, the, these are sensory neurons, um, and they st stimulate these nociceptors, which uh, give you a bunch of pain signals when you don't actually have any injury to your body. Uh, drive, it's a major driver of Parkinson's disease because intracranial LPS stimulates an immune response that starts eating away at your, at your nerve cells. Of course, numerous types of autoimmune conditions as well. So, um, you know, to, to summarize all of that, basically what you have is it starts with the dysbiosis, right? And we showed you just the dysbiosis alone in that review paper is a major driver of numerous chronic illnesses. Then you end up with low keystone strains like acromantia, fecalum bacteria, which have been shown in review papers to be protective to the host, protects against cardiometabolic syndrome, against IBD, Crohn's, colitis, colorectal cancer, and so on. You also end up losing diversity. We know that diversity is absolutely important in uh, maintaining uh, a healthy overall outcome. It's uh, associated with longevity. Diversity is also associated with a good barrier function, so you don't end up with the other problems. We also see low short-chain fatty acid production as part of this process, and that drives loads of conditions as well. Disrupted immune uh, mucosa and disrupted immune mucosal response, 
and finally a broken down barrier and a leaking in of LPS and other toxins. And I just showed you a bunch of papers that show LPS drives, um, you know, central insulin resistance, pancreatic insulin resistance, uh, Alzheimer's, autoimmune conditions, Parkinson's, uh, anxiety, depression, all of these things, right? So the purpose of all of those papers and all that is that it becomes really clear that 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 you can understand that this same dysfunction that you see on the screen right now is a driver of so many varied conditions, conditions that are seemingly unrelated. But now we know that this same thing drives all of those conditions. And that's exciting in a way because it gives us a roadmap to how to reduce our risk for many of those conditions or even go about supporting our body to try to heal from those conditions if they do exist. We can basically reverse this whole process and fix the dysbiosis and fix the barrier function and go back to having lower risk for all of those times. So uh, do you want to do q and I do. How much? How many more slides do you have? It's just that I know you have to go in about 20 minutes, and I want to make yeah. sure that we get to some Q&As. And also, what do we do about it? <laughs> exactly. So this is the part that the total gut restoration comes in, right? We The way we looked at it is because dysbiosis is the first thing that goes wrong. And remember, that means diversity and low keystone strains. We need to start by fixing the dysbiosis. Once we fix the dysbiosis and we uh, change the microbial population in the microbiome, meaning we have higher keystone strains, we have higher diversity, then we can come in and start to repair the mucosal structure and start to repair the intestinal lining itself, right? So that's the important part. And that's where this system comes in. This is a very specific systemic approach to fixing all of those things that are going wrong. So it starts with what we call the recondition phase of the microbiome. And that's done with the megaspore biotic, the spore biotic, because we've shown uh, in a recently published study that when you add in the spores into your gut, they uh, automatically increase the growth of keystone strains. Those really important acromantia, fecalum bacteria, bifida longum, ruminococcus, all of these important keystone strains that fix all of those dysfunctions are repaired by the megaspore biotic. So in fact, some of those keystone strains like acromantia, we saw a hundredfold increase in that bacteria in just three weeks of taking the megaspore. Same wow. thing we saw, right? A hundredfold. Now, we're not talking about two times, five times, you know, 50% increase. We're talking about a hundredfold increase. In fecalum bacteria prosnitsi, we saw a thousandfold increase in a number of the subjects, uh, microbiomes, when we, when we added in the spores. So it's really an important way of increasing and change, increasing those beneficial bacteria and changing the microbiome population in general. So fixing the dysbiosis. The other thing that it does is it helps to bring down the overgrowth of, of non-beneficial bacteria, ones that could be harmful that are overgrown because of dysbiosis. It brings those down. We also see an increase in diversity in the microbiome, which now you know is extremely important when you add in the spores, right? So we have studies on all of these things that we're looking at. Now, once you start reconditioning the gut, you would do this in the for the first four weeks. You would start on the megaspore biotic. Um, and then you would uh, you would slowly dose yourself up over the first couple of weeks. By the end of the fourth week, you should be on the full dose of two caps a day. And we can talk about how you scale that dosing up. But at the end of the fourth week, what you do is we want to reinforce those positive changes by bringing in a precision prebiotic. Now, what we've done is we've carefully selected very specific oligosaccharides that are designed to only feed the beneficial bacteria in your gut. You know, one of the dangers of just general prebiotics and fibers is if your gut already has dysbiosis, they can fit, they can feed the dysfunctional bacteria just as well as any good bacteria. So you might be making the problem worse and perpetuating the issue. But in this case, we have a precision prebiotic that has been clinically shown to come in and basically feed all the good bacteria that the probiotic is now enhancing the growth of. So we actually just recently published a study. I'll show you uh, just the paper of it. Uh, where you combine the probiotic and the prebiotic, and basically the prebiotic more than doubles all of the beneficial effects of the probiotics. So affirming that new non-dysbiotic microbiome, right? That's the first step in fixing the gut. 
You cannot fix the gut without fixing that dysbiosis. So you start first four weeks megaspore with reconditioning. The second four weeks, you stay on the megaspore, but you add in the prebiotic. And then at the end of that second four weeks, so you now you're at eight weeks, then you're ready to start rebuilding all of those mucosal structures. And in order to rebuild the mucosal structure and the intestinal lining, you have to provide the tools for the microbiome and, the, and, the, and your gut lining to repair itself. First, one of those important tools are immunoglobulins. Bovine IgG has been shown, even in HIV patients who have very severe leaky gut, to be able to reverse some of that process of leakiness in the gut and bring down the inflammation that's, that's occurring in the mucosa of the gut lining. So that's really important. That's why we put it in there. They have numerous publications on this effect. Polyphenols are going to become one of the most important co compounds for gut function. These polyphenols have been shown to, to improve the tight junctions, bring down the inflammatory response in the gut mucosa, and help the gut mucosa rebuild itself. It also has been shown to increase the diversity within the microbiome itself. And then the last thing is four critical amino acids. These four critical amino acids have been shown to be the major building blocks of the gut mucosal structure, especially that inner part of the gut mucosa that is supposed to act as a significant barrier. In studies, they've shown that when they damage the gut lining, of course, you do this in animals, you can't do it in humans. When you purposely damage the, uh, the gut lining, when you add in these particular four amino acids, it rebuilds the gut mucosa by 95%. Right, So it's a very important tool in rebuilding the gut mucosa. So the last four weeks, so weeks eight through 12, you, you're staying on the spores, you're staying on the prebiotic, and then you're adding in this last product called the mega mucosa into your gut building regimen. And in that last four weeks, you're doing all three products at once. Right, So first four weeks, you start with just the probiotic. Second four weeks, you add in the prebiotic. Third, fourth, uh, the third four weeks, you add in the mega mucosa as well. This is basically how you restore your gut. Now, the next several slides is a whole bunch of studies showing, and the, these are um, our studies that we've done in many cases, showing you the data on how these different components fix all of those parts of the gut that I've talked about being dysfunctional. The, uh, the diversity, it almost doubles the diversity in the microbiome, increases that acromantia by a hundredfold, the fecalum bacteria by a thousandfold, uh, almost doubles the bifidobacteria level, doubles the, uh, the uh, lactobacillus level and rumnococcus and all that in the gut. It reinforces those changes, so you get a strong diversity in the microbiome. Now, when you put in the mega mucosa, you start repairing the lining, the mucosa, and all of that, and you start to totally restore your gut and protect yourself from this particular scenario here, right? Woo! This thing here, yeah. So remember, this drives huge numbers of chronic illnesses, many of them that are seemingly unrelated, right? Your doctor and you would have never thought that gastroesophageal reflux disease had the same root cause as anxiety and depression, right? Those two things are so different, and yet they're driven by the same root cause. So this is the simplistic way in which you do it. Okay. Karen, we have so many questions for you. I'm just going to do my best in the next. Yeah. You have to leave in about 12 minutes, right? Yes. Okay. We'll do a fire round. We can do it. I love it. Okay. Does the prebiotic have casein protein in it? It does not. It, uh, it does not have any casein, any dairy protein in it. Um, so one of the prebiotics comes from, it's a galacto oligosaccharide. So it does come from, from dairy but it's purified where just the oligosaccharide is in there. You don't have any of the milk derivatives or milk protein in it at all. It's just the oligosaccharide. Now, if you are anaphylactic against milk products, uh, we would say to be very cautious and, and, and maybe don't even use it. Uh, but if you, if you believe you're sensitive to dairy, we have not had any issues with people sensitive to dairy at all using it. Okay. Is it okay to start intestinal mega mucosa when starting your mega spore biotic, or should we wait and do it in the order you just talked about? Yeah. So that's a great question. That's very instinctive uh, of that uh, individual that asked. So in the clinic, what we've done is in some patients, we do start them with the mega mucosa at the same time as the mega spore. 
Why do we do that? Well, um, in some people who are very sensitive that tend to have die-off reactions when they take a strong probiotic that is going to bring down the growth of pathogens, uh, one of the things that can really help minimize that die-off is this immunoglobulin product in the, in the megamucosa. So for those people, it actually is a benefit to start the megamucosa scoops one a day while they start taking their megaspore as well. Okay, and um, Ingrid says, and she's a regular, hi, hi everybody, by the way, glad you're here. Ingrid's saying that she um, doesn't do well with a microdose of Megaspore or Just Thrive. Can she try the prebiotic instead to try to get her gut going and then add it? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you might actually even try the prebiotic and megamucosa combination. Uh, one of the reasons you may not do well even with tiny doses of the spores is the die-off symptomology is just too strong. And you may need some um, gut rebuilding even before you get the spores in there, or at least minimizing the immune re response in the gut to the die-off. And the combination of the, of the megamucosa and, and megaprebiotic can certainly help with that. So in your case, you might go reverse. You might start with this for uh, the megamucosa for three or four weeks, just do one scoop a day, and then go to the, uh, the mega pre, and then add in the spores at the end. You could do it that way as well. And can you stay on the IgG and this whole entire program, for that matter, long term? Yeah. So the way we, we do it with, with doctors in, uh, in the clinic is we say, you go through this. This is basically like a 90-day uh, gut restoration program, right? And so at the end of the 90-day period, you basically reassess how you're feeling. If the issues that you're dealing with are completely under control, you feel great, everything is, is where it should be, then what we recommend people doing is continuing on the megaspore as like your daily protection because we do live in a toxic world. And so there's lots of stuff around you that's always trying to create dysbiosis. Uh, but you can keep the mega prebiotic and the mega mucosa and use it intermittently if you don't want to use it every day. Now, I use it every day. I always have it in a bottle like this because I put my my body through a lot of stress. Uh, but if, you're, if you've got a pretty clean diet, clean lifestyle, you don't travel a lot, uh, you may be able to get away with just using them a couple of times a week while you're taking your Megaspore every day. Now, at the end of that 90-day period, if your symptomologies and issues are much better but are not quite there yet, then we recommend people just doing another 90-day cycle and seeing where you are at the end of that. Okay. And guys, I have a discount code coming up for you, but I'm not going to do it right now. I'm going to wait because we only have eight more minutes with Kieran and then I'll post it. Um, you'll like it. Okay. Here's the question. Why, you know, when people take those GI map tests, spore-based probiotics are listed as opportunistic. And I think there's a fear that they're going to take over your entire being. I remember reading and listening to a podcast years ago before I knew you where that was really put a fear in my life. And now, I've, of course, I've been loving Megaspore and it's changed my life. So I don't have that fear because that's not what happened to me. But what do you say to people who are misinformed in that way? You know, the problem with those GI map tests and, and many of the stool tests is they're completely inaccurate. And they were developed well before the microbiome research even came out. You know, they, they are, they use a technology called 16S sequencing, which is very inaccurate. Um, they look at like 30 different species when your gut has up to five, 600 species. Um, they don't, they can't make sense of what's high, what's low in any accurate fashion. And there's been a number of studies that have come out that show that their methodology of testing the fecal sample is extremely inaccurate. There's very little value in most of those tests, and it's absolutely insane and, and may, may I say asinine that they would put bacillus as part of an opportunistic category because numerous papers are published to show that bacillus is a normal commensal bacteria in the gut microbiome of virtually everyone that they've tested, right? And bacillus has, of course, been used for over 60 years in the uh, prescription market as a probiotic since 1952. Um, so... It just speaks to the inaccuracy and the folly of those tests. Um, they really haven't done much good for people because a lot of times you get those tests and you see like four pluses for a particular pathogen and you go, oh my God, I got to hit myself with a bunch of antimicrobials for a while. And then that often leads people into more problems than, than uh, resolution. So take those with a grain of salt. They, they, they tend to be um, very little value in really figuring out what's wrong with your gut. Well, that is fascinating. 
I wanted to um, to ask you about people who don't have good results with taking probiotics when they have SIBO. And mm. then there are other people who take probiotics and it's like a miracle when they have SIBO. Mm. So I have a theory and I wanted to know what you thought about that. I think it has to do with their underlying cause. And then mm -hmm. if you have slow motility from your migraine motor complex or you have adhesions or loopy bowel or diverticulitis, it might be something that you just want to super duper microdose. But then other people who don't have those kinds of motility obstacles might do really well on it. What do you think? Yeah, and, and I think it's important to distinguish what type of probiotic we're talking about, right? So, Amen. yeah, Amen. that's the important part of it. So we can't generalize all probiotics. Uh, we find in general that uh, leaky gut is at the root cause of SIBO. Um, the LPS that migrates through the leakiness in the gut, and I have a whole SIBO talk on this particular um, mechanism of action. So the LPS goes through. And it goes into the vagal afferent nerve in the basically in the base of the brain, and it stops the communication between the between the brain and the gut, and and that causes stasis, the the lack of motility and lack of movement in the bowel, which is at a big part of the root cause of SIBO. And what's interesting is the studies that that show that also show that even prokinetics cannot help restart the gut because the signals from the brain are cut off from the gut from LPS. So it's leaky gut that's driving that chronic stasis, and, and that leaky gut is allowing the, the, um, the bowels to stop moving, and then that allows the accumulation of unwanted bacteria in the bowels. Now, one of the spore strains in Megaspore, the Clausi, has a study showing that it can actually bring down the overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine. And then also, because we can stop that leakiness in the gut, I didn't show the paper here, but... Uh, we've got a publication showing we could stop LPS migration in a very significant manner. We we give the the bowel a chance to restart itself, you know. So in general, we have people uh, that we work with in the clinics that we work with use Megaspore as part of their SIBO treatment. It's not going to be the only thing you use. There are other things that you're going to need as well. But it becomes a really important part because you have to stop that leakiness. And you have to stop that LPS migrating into the into the a uh, vagal afferent nerve. That is very interesting because it would, it's it's truly a new way of looking at the horse cart cart horse issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is very very interesting. Um, yeah, I I did a talk on SIBO and I gave you know like twenty that uh, twenty slides of lecture of all of the things going wrong that lead to that final symptom of overgrowth and bloating and distension. You know that's a symptom of all of these other things going wrong we uh, become obsessed about that symptom, right? And we're trying to bring down the bloating. We, we're hitting with, the, with antimicrobials and so on. Uh, and we're, we're adjusting our diet so we don't get the bloating effect. And yet we're not really addressing all of these things that are causing it in the first place. So the leaky gut, there's so much good data showing that leaky gut is a big driver of stasis. So here's the thing. I just know I want to really honor your time. And I need to just read a testimonial from Carol, who posted in the Facebook group. Could you please explain uh, how the spores reduce an overgrowth of bacteria, specifically in the small intestine, which is what you just said, mm -hmm. which I'm going to talk to you about getting that presentation. Mm -hmm. And this is what Carol said. I started the SIBO protocol and the total gut restoration starting seven months ago, and I am now doing fantastic. I've been able to add more foods to my diet, and even the arthritis in my fingers is so much better. Thank you, Kieran, for all your help to me and for all that you do to share your incredible knowledge. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for reading that. That's that's why we do what we do, right? That's why we we spend the endless hours researching, flying around, educating uh, for that kind of result. And, you know, the, the whole idea there is just kind of taking a, a different look at it um, and seeing that these spores have the ability to competitively exclude overgrown and pathogenic bacteria. They do quorum sensing. Uh, they can go in, they can read the microbial environment, including the small bowel. And when you have overgrown bacteria, they'll produce antibiotics in that microenvironment to bring down the overgrowth of those bacteria. You know, we see it in liver failure patients where we get ammonia levels to come down almost 40%, even though these people are on rifaximin and those levels are still high. So um, it's it's really quite a profound thing. And um, I'm, I'm happy to share, you know, uh, my discussions with Carol on on the, the the procedure you should take in thinking about SIBO differently. Um, and maybe we could do that as, as another, our next program.
Yeah, that sounds great. I have a couple of ideas about that. So we can get that information to everybody ASAP. We love you. We thank you, sir. Thank you for the discount. He's giving us 15% off when you buy the Mega Spore, the Mega Prebiotic, and the, um, the IgG product. So we're going to give you that information. Karen, I want to honor your time. I love you. Goodbye. You are so sweet. Thank you so much for that, uh, Siobhan. It's always an honor being part of this. Um, happy to send the slides to if you want to make it available to your uh, to your audience. Uh, we could do a PDF. And if any other questions come up while I'm while I while I've left, feel free to email it to me, and I'll try to get them answered. And so you can send people the answers in writing. Okay, I don't know if you if you realize what you just asked for because I have about a hundred questions. For you, <laughs> yes, download them and send them over to me. I've got a long flight to Japan tomorrow. Great. Um, I've got about you know twelve hours on the plane, so maybe I can get to a good number of them on the flight. Okay, that's amazing. Thank you so much. That is an incredibly generous offer. I have a couple of ideas. I'm going to send you an email and we will connect. Thank this you so much. Helpful. Okay, love you, bye -bye. Karen. Thank you. you bye bye. Thank you. I'm going to let him go, and I'm going to. Um, to do a couple of things. I'm going to right now. Bye, Karen. Safe travels. Talk to you later. Thanks so much for joining us, you guys. What a generous offer that he's just made to carry on with the Q&As. And I know we have one of our team members who's been gathering them. And I think what we could do is uh, to get even more questions answered, maybe he can record into his phone and then we can transcribe it and send it to you. Now, here's what's happening. I have a discount code for you. I want to put the link for the website uh, in the Facebook thread and in the Zoom thread, and we will include it in an email. If you go to Microbiome Labs and you want to purchase this, you use the patient direct code, SIBO SOS. And then if you want the 15% off all three products when you buy them simultaneously, it's Gut Restore 15. I've got something else for you too. If you ever want to, in the future, buy any other Megaspore products, make it a really big bundle because I have a one-time additional 15% off coupon for you that is Digestion SOS. But you can't use it when you're purchasing this particular three-pack bundle, which is actually really cool because you could get two 15% off coupons. I hope that made sense. My cat is starving. My husband just walked in. I'm going to wrap this up and I'm going to post the the links and the coupon codes in the in the um you know comments and then for those of you on zoom um we will send it to you in an email along with the recording Woo! okay um i love you all i thank you so much and i will talk to you very soon okay watch for those coupon codes if you didn't just catch them and look for an email with your recording in there um in the next couple of days we'll get it to you as soon as possible Mwah! Love you. Thank you. Another huge thank you to Kieran. He really is remarkable and all of the breakthroughs that he is bringing to the world, all of those studies. I'm really excited to see what he does next. Remember, if you want to try any of the products that Kieran mentioned yourself, you can save 15% on that first order by registering with patient direct code SIBO SOS at microbiomelabs.com and then use discount code digestion SOS at checkout. And to see the slides that Karen referenced during our discussion, you can be sure to check the show notes for those. We'll get them to you and you can watch the video as well. It all sounds complicated, but it's not. I promise it's really simple and it's so important that you get all this information. So check all the show notes because we'll have more information for you there and also some upcoming events. Thanks for joining me. I'm Siobhan Sarna and see you the next time on the SIBO SOS podcast.